came down on the procedure on how to um, set up multiple digital modulators in one installation. Um, the reason we've sort of done this presentation is we've just gone back through all the tech support calls that we do and the majority of questions we get asked is what do I do? I've bought a modulator, there's already one here. <clears throat> I plug one in. The majority of people don't do anything. So in the sense that they don't know how to set up two modulators. <clears throat> so an installer may even buy two modulators, go on site, plug them in, set the channels, set the logical channel numbers, and that's it. But there's a few settings that you need to change, and the easiest way to change them is through the software interface. So all of our products now have got a, um, a web interface, so you do need a laptop, and what you can do then is pretty much just do it much more efficiently, rather than doing it from a tiny little screen with three buttons. So, if we look at how to use this dual screen thing, we can Okay, so multiple modulators in, in an MATV system. Um, Sometimes it might get a little bit more complicated in the sense that there may be a different manufacturer's product in there and a lot of the settings are pretty much different to ours. So we take that on a case by case basis. So get them to call me and I can ask all the you know, right questions. But we'll just focus on Resilinx products. So when, when you talk to you guys and they want to do this. Prefer to have Windows 7 and above, um, purely because XP just, A, it's not supported anymore, and there's a little bit of mucking around to get it to detect the modulator when you plug into the uh, web interface port automatically. It's just, uh, it's just quicker with Windows 7. So, um, so I'm going to show you an example of the web interface and <clears throat> a configuration example. So if you know that you're going to be, you know, selling or going to an on, going to a site and you're going to be setting up multiple modulators, I've got a little cheat sheet that you should follow before you go out. So you can even do this before you take them on site. So. And that's what I recommend everyone does. You know, your guys, I know they come and buy a modulator and they rush on site. Everyone's time poor. But if you can just take a step back, get them to take it a day or two beforehand, take it home, program it up, and try. That way, they familiarise themselves. And if there's any problems, it's, it's much, less, um, much less stressful because you're not there calling me, you know, five to five. Friday afternoon before a race weekend and it's not working. So then the physical connection, that's going to be pretty straightforward. It's RG6. I'll show you a few examples. It's probably you know already familiar to you, but it's just an example. And then one thing I haven't covered before in training is um, measurements and level adjustments. Um, to be honest with you, it's scary how many people set these things up without fuel strength meters. So, opportunity there, still to this day. You're chuckling. It, it, it's just, it's, not, it's, it, it's shocking. It's honestly, yeah. I would say the majority of non antenna guys, so your Sparkies, your security guys, um, even some AV guys who are tending to put a lot of this stuff in. You've got a meter that's relatively inexpensive. Um, so I always say, you know, you need a meter. Because when you call me, I'm going to ask you for some numbers. It helps me help them a lot quicker. So, by default, 
there's a few there's a few settings. So I've, I'm using two HDMI modulators here for an example. And what I've done here is I've just listed the default factory settings. So the modulators by default come set to channel 21. And 21 is what we call an S-band channel. TVs cannot tune to that automatically. They ignore it. So if you can see there, if you connect this modulator into an antenna system, it auto tune TV is not even going to see it. We get that happen from time to time. The modulator just gets connected, nothing's done, my, ch my TV doesn't pick it up. What channel have you got it set up to? I haven't set it. Okay, then I explain the channel 21 thing. So, you know, maybe at the point of sale, you can maybe drop that and say, hey, because who reads manuals? So you maybe drop that in and say, hey, by the way, you have to set a channel. <clears throat> so, the other thing in setting a channel, and this is another reason that a field strength meter, is what channel do you set it to? So, transmitters are different in, you know, regional areas than CBD, and even CBD's got, you know, UHF repeaters. So, finding a channel that doesn't have 4G interference, that doesn't have an existing transmitter on it, that's the first thing. That's the second thing you install I used to do. And a lot of the times I get that question. What channel do I set it to? Where are you? There is a web page that I use quite a bit. Um, MyDigitalSwitch.gov.au And what that website does, you type in your address and it will give you a list of where the transmitters are. So it's mainly used for people who are in fringe areas, you can work out whether to get vast satellite services, but that helps me because I can quickly see where they are. Say, so, okay, try this channel. But you want them to do that. So that's the output channel. That's a default output channel. They have to change. Um, logical channel numbers. Everyone know what a logical channel number is? Yes or no? Okay. Logical channel number is what the customers press on their remote to bring up the modulated channel. Usually leave them as factory. I've had a few instances where they've set it to 70 something and then channel 7 switches on 78 and it doesn't work anymore. So keep away from what the broadcasters use and it's different in all locations. So generally we say <coughs> stick with what's in the modulator and just increment up from there. Program number, really it's an it's a internal setting that we do have to change, specifically for some Panasonic TVs. And then stream ID, that's probably the most important one. But what you can see there, if someone installed a modulator, and for example, if they did change that, and they did change that, but they didn't change the transport stream, there's your problem. Because the majority of people can work out, oh, it has to be on a different channel. That's what I used to do with analog. That's where a lot of guys are coming from, analog days. So it's just a couple of extra little steps that we have to sort of hold your hand through. So that's the default settings. Um, all our fours, um, our SD4, Outputs on one channel. You see here the HD4002, the, H, the high definition version, actually sets the second channel automatically for you because we do two HD streams on one physical channel. <clears throat> so, this is what I would recommend. So, we've got the HD1600 pretty much set to channel 40. We've left that as default. Um, program number is really just a, you're just covering yourself for compatibility with older TVs. Normally you don't have to change it, but I just tell the installers regardless, if you're in the software, it's only gonna take you another few seconds to change another setting. So, my rule of thumb is I get them to change it, make it the same as the LCN number. 
that way it just keeps it consistent all the way through. <coughs> so you can see there the first modulator, we've got it set to 101. Then the first input on the second, 102, 103, 104, 105. So from the end user's point of view, they're not going to know that they've got one modulator, two modulators. It, it's, just, it's just a channel. Now, also importantly is the stream ID. Um, without getting too technical on that, it just needs to be different for each modulator. Simple as that. I've just followed that. You could follow 1001, 1002, 1003. And then just from a user-friendly point of view, when you change a channel, you can actually label the channel that comes up on the screen. So that's just an example there. I don't know how readable that is, by the way. So that's just the two tables side by side. So you can see you can see the difference what we've done. Um, I can make these slides available. So the next the next screen is the um, web interface. I know this one you can't see from back there. But, yeah. Right. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so. When you log into the modulator, um, and if you haven't done that before, I can talk you through that. But this is what you see. You see your welcome screen initially, and you can see there that the default is 21, and um, you know the channel name is channel 1, channel 2, and we just set the MP2 there. So then we move on to the next screen. And that's where we change the output channel. So this is on the 4002. This is the HDMI, 4-channel HDMI model. So whatever you set, it will set this, the second channel automatically for you. Then the RF setup is the next screen. So you just work your way down that left-hand corner there. <clears throat> so over here, we've got the stream ID that we need to change. And that's it there. All of these settings are preset. You can't change them. There's no need to change them. They're really there for broadcasters. So in broadcast situations where you do need different levels of error correction, guardianable constellation, that's what that's for. But in a cable MATV system, you're not going to be susceptible to those errors that happen to a signal while it's transmitted through the air. So. That's why there's no need to change them. The encoder setup. So with the four channel encoder, or four channel modulator, I should say, it's got four encoders, one for each input. And you can change the level um, of brightness, contrast, saturation for each one of those. But more importantly, this is where the LCN number is. Um, so remember before we had the HD1600 was set to 101. So on this one, you would change it to 102, 103, 104. And you just do that for each encoder. You've got the channel name there, uh, program number, and what else? That's basically it. For stacking. There is an MPEG-2, MPEG-4 setting there, but we won't get into that. Uh, network configuration not applicable when you're stacking, but if you're setting this thing on a LAN, you could actually give it a fixed IP address, and you could log into it remotely if you wanted to. And then the administration where you can actually save the configuration. So if you're doing multiple modulators across multiple installations, and you know that they're basically going to be the same, you can save the configuration file, upload it, save you few minutes, but multiply that over a lot of instances. Feel free to ask questions as I go. Which is always up a fixed IP so that you know where it was? Does it DHCP? You for can. Reason? Um, no, the, this is maybe something I'll discuss with you later, but what that is for, that there's two things. When we enable DHCP, it enables you to connect to it to set it up. 
So if I connect my laptop directly to the modulator, if it's looking for an IP, if it doesn't find an IP server, yeah. or DHCP server, sorry, it's going to allocate itself a private IP address. Follow me? So it'll be a 169.254. whatever. whatever. If your laptop connects to it and they both don't find the DHCP server, they'll give themselves a random IP address in that range, 169.254. So when both of your machines are in that range and you connect them together, this will appear as a network device in your network icon in your computer. And that's how we log into it. Alternatively, if you had a fixed IP address set on that, you'd have to go to your laptop, set an IP in the same range. You can do that, because you can actually do that from the front panel on the 4002. Yeah. Clear as mud? Yeah. But Marco, the IP range, because I was just thinking about that. <coughs> King Ray, I had to change the IP range for our system here, the resi links I don't need to. Mm -hmm. Memory 192.168.168 is the range. Or? It's the last four, the last four sub numbers are random. Yeah. So what you'd actually have to do, what I've done with my laptop, just to get into them quicker, is I've got it set to 169, oh, sorry, 169.254.1.1 with a subnet of 255.255.0.0. So if you do that, It'll log into any 169254 <coughs> dot dot. Yeah, no, I just thought it's funny that the resi links automatically appears. Like I, installers get me to set these up for them all the time. and um, Because they don't know how? No, because they're lazy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 um, the Remy for but that. yeah, the resi links you just plug straight in, bang, in network places. Like, I don't, it's not complicated at all. But the, King Ray, you've got to go 192 We have to change, change the settings on our system. Yeah, the, do you hook it into a DHC, do you hook it into yeah, a network DHCP, here? Yeah. So that's the we, other thing. DHCP that, is fine, yeah. obviously, for here. It's just going to be kind of available. If your, if your network was in that King Ray range. But yeah, the King Ray's not in the range, the residence yeah. is. That's a funny bit. Like, I mean, some switches, TP link. You know, use or Dingly use 10.10.10 .10 .10 or whatever. Mm. Um, so it's a little bit all over the place. But yeah, the, I mean, ours. If you connect it to a, um, if you connect it to a network with a DHCP server, mm. it'll pick that up. Yeah. So if you want a foolproof, fail-safe installation all the time to access, if you're doing a lot of them. You carry just a cheap Wi-Fi router around with you, just plug everything into it, and it'll just work straight. And you can do it wirelessly too. So that's what I did at um, One Integrate. Just d domestic little net gear, static IP. As soon as you plug a modulator in, I can access it remotely, no cables. So. Probably repeating, you know, what you already know, but um, just an example. Our RF three eighty has actually got two inputs. Um, one is active and one is passive. What I mean by active is the whole. If you're running uh, IR targets from this, it could all be powered from the modulator. So there's no need to, you know, find a power point in the ceiling. Um, if this is in a rack, you could actually, you know, connect both modulators into each input. Um, a passive system, basically a two-way splitter in reverse. So this is pretty much doing what this is. So you've got the antenna coming in there, mixed in with the two modulators, mixed in just sort of passive splitter. Depending on your on your um, on your installation, you, you may need a launch amp there, um, or you may have a 
some other distribution app, but it's just an example of what you can do. If you had another modulator here, you'd use a three-way splitter. You could, use, you could even use a tap because these things do have quite a bit of output. So, yeah, up around the 90. Um, so, a tap will give you a little bit of attenuation. But that's, that's pretty well it. To get the IR, you, you need the other one, don't you? You need that. You need that. Yeah. Oh. That's right. These. So, I uh, uh, pass through. From it has an IR return path. So, what you would do in that situation is you'd run the modulator into that port. Uh, you then need the RF210 at the other end of each of each thing that um, of each port that wants control. The IR comes, um, you know, back down the coax into this, back into that, and there's an IR output on the back of the modulator. There's also an IR output. There. So if this was in a rack and you had maybe the HDs that didn't have IR return, you could just take an IR straight out of the hub. You can run a 2-port emitter. I think there's even three head emitters as well out there. I've never tested them. Right? But just, just to do that, you, you need that. that you need that. Split. You need yeah. that because yeah. what, the, the way the system works is we run a 5-volt system. The reason for that is if you've got some TVs that don't have or that don't want IR, 5 volts at an antenna socket is okay for most TVs. Some older TVs you need to use a DC block because it just plays with the tuner. But the newer TVs are fine with 5 volts. So 12 volts to that, that then gives 5 volts to all of those guys, and then the IR comes back to the modulator. <coughs> I've just got to remember the switch at the back if you're going to be powering it. Yeah, you've got to power, got to power that, and you can't use power supply. Don't use a power supply straight into this. So you want everything to run off from the modulator. That's another mistake. Set it all up, plug it all in, IR doesn't work. First question, do you have a power supply plug into the RF radio? Yeah, unplug it. Oh, why? Just unplug it, tell me if it works. Right, great, it works. And then you explain why. Just run that by me again, so I didn't, I didn't, okay. I didn't pick what it, when you sorry. When you buy one of these, it yeah. comes with a power supply. Yeah, okay. I got that bit, but I didn't understand why. Like, why the you... reason is, the IR return path has to be enabled through this. So if we connect the power supply into this, it disables the IR return path. Because it can be used as a standalone. So when you plug the power directly into there, no IR comes out of that port. So you'd use the power supply in the case of the 1600. That's right. That's right. 4000. 4000. Yeah. So when that's in a rack, that's how it's It's just, you know, it gives you. Give you, give you options. Uh, believe it or not, our industry has a standard. Um, I won't go into detail, but that's it. You can buy it, purchase it, copy it, whatever. But pretty much um, it just lays out a guideline for signal levels and error measurements. So the reason I'm showing you this is if you have an installation with marginal TV reception, someone connects a modulator, doesn't have a field strength meter. Marco, um, every time I hook up this damn modulator, I lose all my TV channels. What level are you running? Oh, I left my meter in the van. Can you go get it? Oh, it's in the other van. Okay, see that little blue knob on the back of the modulator? Turn it all the way down. Oh, it's fixed it. Okay, now wind it up to your turns. Yep, fantastic, great. Okay, now don't buy a field strength meter. So, these things, putting out almost 100 dB, <coughs> what it does, it raises the noise floor 
even though you might be 30, 40 channels away from your free to air, I liken it to, okay, you're having a conversation with your mates. We're talking at this level. Then your loud, obnoxious mate comes in. He's the modulator. <laughs> <laughs> then we can't hear what we're talking about. Because someone loud is coming into the party. That's exactly the same. The, the noise floor is raised. You just, you just need to turn him down. That's a common mistake. When we're testing the antennas on the roof, we're testing the basic log periodics and the other ones. But the log periodics, that is a big issue. It's about 20 dB difference between different channels. And the PV tuners weren't, weren't liking that. So people say, oh, if you get a cheap antenna here yeah, that transmitters over a kilometre or whatever, yeah. but still you have an issue because of that noise. Floor. Exactly. I've got a couple of slides that shows you the difference, the recommended measurement between adjacent channels, a couple more. Um, but the other noise, for example, is um, analogy. You and your mate in a car, driving to wherever, you're having a conversation, you mate in the back just have a cigarette, you wind the window down. At 100 k's you can't hear each other. So that's the noise floor. The noise floor is quiet, window goes down. Same thing with RF. Connect something in at a different level, it's going to create so, if you ended up with the same, if you, if you targeted the same angle at the point for the modulator as your antenna system, that's my point. Okay. If you take a reading, make it the same. As make it the same as that. Within. Yeah, close. Within close. Yeah. So you know the difference between the maximum level difference right across the full bandwidth between each channel should be no more than 18, as an example. Um, you know, adjacent channel shouldn't be more than 12. So if it gets above that, your noise floor is where the DVBT error correction method just just can't lock in. You know, can't lock in. <coughs> I'll put it in. There were, this table had analog in there, so I'll just edit it a little bit. Um, quality measurements is pretty important too because when I talk to people on the phone. I like to know mainly that one. These, these don't really relate to modulation in that sense because pre Viterbi and post Viterbi are pretty much what happens to the signal as it goes through the airwaves. So that's, that's an error correction. We don't have that interference in a close system. That and that is pretty much what I want to know. If someone tells you it's below that, it's below that. But then, if someone's coming to you and you know asking you questions on signals and they've got problems with signals and they don't know how to fix it, you sort of have to take a bit more of a. I ask a lot of questions. I don't assume because you never know who you're talking to at the other end. So if they ask me certain questions, I know if they're an antenna installer, uh, their level of skill by the questions they ask. So I never, I never assume, because sometimes they might be someone who's just having a bad day. They're annoyed because they just, they just had a moment. They haven't had their coffee. And really, sometimes they just need to bounce things off you. And a lot of people are quite good. They ring up and say, hey, I forgot, what do I do again? Blah, blah, blah. Ah, oh, thanks, see ya. Pretty straight. But um, yeah, the, these are Australian standards. I haven't fudged these by any stretch of the imagination. Now we're going to time. Uh, yeah, half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Um, <coughs> AV to IP. Now this is, um, a little bit specialised in the sense that you wouldn't sort of um, recommend this over a modulator um, if you've got RG6 there. The reason for all that is there's very specific skills required from an IP point of view to get it working. Um, and you also have to have very specific equipment. But essentially what this device does 
let's just take HDMI signal or component video composite. So that's what we call legacy. So analog products. Um, so your VCRs, things like that. And convert it to an IP stream. And what an IP stream is, basically just a video file a stream, like you're watching YouTube. It's, it's that type of device. So what that, what's that let you do? Well, if our internet in Australia was that good, as in upload, you could have this connected to your Foxtel and stream it into the internet and watch it with your beach house. Or you could, uh, in a corporate situation like this, have uh, advertising, advertising media player in there, and you could have specials scrolling through, or pretty much anything, use your imagination. Uh, also commonly used um, in situations where there's physically no RG6. So there are some places that are not wiring with RG6. But there's another product for that. So what we can do with that, we can control, without getting too technical, we've got a couple of different modes of operation. Um, we've got full HD and we can adjust the bit rate. We can adjust how much information is actually encoded and how much data this produces. So how sharp the picture looks at the other end. So if one of these streams was just an information screen, we would reduce the bit rate and therefore reduce the amount of data that's on the network. If we had a sports channel, we would probably bump that up a little bit. So there's no blockiness, there's no artifacts, it looks crystal clear. Uh, so that's, you know, there's preset, what we call profiles in this as well. So if you don't want to go through and change, you know, the bit rate for the audio, the bit rate for the video, you can just select one of the profiles in the required main or base, and then within that you've got a few different versions, you can just try different ones and see what suits the network. Uh, free streaming protocols. HTTP, everyone's familiar with that. That's pretty much what they use on the internet. Um, and DLNA. So DLNA is pretty much what you'd use domestically. The only drawback with DLNA is that um, it's not an intelligent system. It just if you put one of these things on a DLNA network, which would be a home router, it's going to flood all the ports on that router with data all the time until you switch that off. Not good in a corporate network, but okay for home because you're just surfing the net and watching the video. Also, DLNA gives you a limitation of about 30 devices. Not, not that it's going to be a problem at home, but you know, in larger installs, you wouldn't, you wouldn't suggest that. Uh, then you've got <coughs> multicast, unicast. Multicast is probably the most common way of sending IP streams to set-top boxes. That's an IP set-top box. Uh, because what multicast lets you do is, um, actually not multicast, the whole format with the use of um, a switch, a specific switch, pretty much listens for these things. And when one of these things switches on and goes to a specific channel, the network switch says, oh, OK, streamer number whatever is requesting that program. So I'll route that data just to that stream. So it's an efficient way of managing data with IP. HTTP doesn't do that. So if you imagine, you know, 20, 30 of these things, um, and some are not being used, but there's just no traffic there. So the whole point of multicast 
is IPTV and IPTV set-top boxes. So there's some commercial panels that support that. Unicast, um, it's point-to-point. -point. It's like making a phone call. You type in an IP address into that. Uh, you could use Unicast with a Cat5 cable from that to that. And that's the way it works. I've had one guy actually have Unicast as a wireless link with these two things. Questions? This one doesn't have HDCP, yeah? This yeah. HDCP? Yeah. Yes. It is. It's full yeah. control. It's not a HDCP server. Yeah. But you can set a static IP or you can set it to DHCP. No, I'm talking about the copyright stuff. Oh, sorry. Yes, it does. It does. It does. So if it does, how oh, it so I can connect to Foxtel? Same as you can connect with our modulars. Okay. <laughs> so we've got we're we're compliant with that. Compliant with yeah. Okay. And I'll explain more of that with these other products. Oh, sorry, just, just so that's just one input. Yeah. Um, and legacy, the the analog inputs. So just just to. Go yeah. back there. Sure. If you, like the difference in traffic is, is going to be significant. Across these? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. really significant. Depending on the installation. Yes. So if you're just in a domestic situation, <clears throat> at work I've got one of these hooked up to our pay TV box, hooked up to a little Wi-Fi router, just a domestic one. I can watch Foxtel on my laptop. Anywhere in the office. Or my tablet. Yeah. Just using VLC. But I dare not, and I have done this, hook this into our corporate network. Uh, when we first got it, you know, when you first get a product from a, you know, from an engineering sample, you go, oh yeah, great, let's plug into a network. Oh, the network just died. And Jason's and Mark, oh, what have you done? But yeah, so you then have to have specific I've got a list of um, switches that we've actually tested and tried. So, if you're interested in that. Yeah. How about the Blu-ray player hook it up with this? Anything. 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 Apple TV. Keep in mind, though, that it's really designed for digital signage. So, the limitations you're going to have is real-time usability. So. If you've ever started something on YouTube or you see that little buffer, in DLNA, you are about, depending on the media player, you're about 8 to 20 seconds latency. So it's not really something that you would have in <coughs> a modulator. Uh, multicast is a little bit better, multicast is about 3 or 4 seconds. And yes. Sneak peek. <coughs> so that was single input. Then we've got two more due for release very soon. We have a four input and we have an eight input. So the IP4000 and the IP8200. So that is that one. And that one. So you can see on the IP4000, it's pretty much it's pretty much four of those. So yes, you have to do the configuration four times because. There's four separate inputs on the back, four IP streams. Menu, exactly the same as that. Now, the 8200 is a little bit different. So you can see it's HDMI only. It's done away with um, <coughs> all the analog inputs, so we've got more room. It's actually a different encoder in there. There's a specific port for setting it up. And a specific port for the stream. Now, what you're saying before, copyright 
The this is a feature we're looking we've been requested to do. Um, so watermarking of the IP screen with the JPEG image. So for the installation that you're putting it in, whether it's uh, Hilton or wherever, or, or if it's Foxtel, you load the logo and it's watermarked over the image. Take that to the next step with the 8200, and there's a feature called forensic embedding. So what that does, it actually embeds the serial number and or a JPEG in the transport stream. So it's not visible. It's it's part of the data stream. So it's in there. So it can have whatever the uh, copyright problem needs. So it's not that anyone's going to part of it, but you know, it's just that it's, it's just what they're requesting. So it gives um, just gives them peace of mind. <coughs> and eight inputs in one AU. So that's that's the physical size of it. Pretty straightforward. Lots of games. Really noisy. You can come and grab that one if you want. Any questions on those? Like I just with Foxtel, commercial Foxtel, you've got ones like the Triax where they've got encryption, which is set approved <coughs> for Foxtel. So when we're doing a commercial job, as long as we've got that encryption. You need something at both ends. Yeah, yeah, and that's got to approve the encryption. This one wouldn't be, would it? It's, it's, um, Jason probably got to give you more detail, but I believe this in particular is probably something new that I'll accept. Um, it gives them the ability, to traceability. Rather than needing a specific car, a specific device at the other end to decode the encryption, um, because I mean that's what's happening with modulators now. You put in a digital modulator and you essentially achieve the same thing. But I understand what you mean, and I sort of I'm probably saying I don't have an answer for that. We'll ask, uh, we'll ask the other person. So then on the on the triax thing, <coughs> um, in a typical situation, if you only had uh, Cat5 and you needed to put all the free-to-air channels in there, previously you'd have to use an alternative system or you'd need one of these for each channel that you wanted to stream. That's where this little product comes in, that guy there. <clears throat> and DVB-T to IP. So each one of those is a TV tuner. And there's eight. And pretty much antenna goes in there and just you just have links going across there. <coughs> so each tuned channel becomes an IP stream, including all the multiplex channels. So channel 10 will have 1, 10, 11, 12, etc, etc. Each one of those is a separate IP. My Do I need to drill into that a little bit deeper? This is with the wiring at the back, because mm -hmm. you know, obviously you've got eight tuners and then you need the links. But what, what are the actual, where would you be inputting? Um, the TV signal. You, it doesn't matter, but I mean normally you can come into one. Yeah, so you've got a TV tuner in the top yep. left, probably link up. Link to across, the, then yeah, across, yeah, like yeah. that, and you just diagonal across. Yeah. Yeah. Put a terminator on that one. <coughs> um, I don't know what that one's on. That's a test port, I believe. So it might be attenuated down. <coughs> but For every one of these, it's admin. I think one, two, three is the logging or the same. There'll be, um, we're actually going across to fixed IPs, 112.168.1.9, um, on a lot of the new stuff. 
Um, it used to be it used to be a private IP address, but we decided to change it. And uh, you can go in and enable the DHCP server on and off. But with these, it will be a fixed IP. Log straight in. It'll just be a little bit quicker. But um, that there basically means that you don't have to have a separate encoder for each channel. And you're really not going to need every single channel. You're not going to need, you know, I don't know, the shopping channels. So you probably won't stream all of those. And there are actually some TVs on the market that have built-in IP set-top boxes. Philips, I think, are one. Um, so they've got that built into the TV. There's no need to buy that. <coughs> Any more questions on that guy? Probably early next year. Yeah, those Philips TVs, we use those at Monash Bacon, actually. Yeah. Oh, Philips TVs. That worked okay. I, I've yeah, never seen one. Yeah, we had it on test for a week. Uh, so, yeah, that is you. Might have to test it. Yeah. And for the TVs that don't have, you know, IP set top box, you need one of these guys. So, you can see, small, compact, um, very, very efficient. It just runs a little 500 million power supply. Uh, analog output or digital, as in HDMI. <coughs> We've got a um, external IR target, so you can mount that up behind the TV, plug in the target, stick the target on the front of the TV. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Last but not least, that is a uh, 20 watt Bluetooth amp with high level speaker input. So, situation installation like this, or a home theatre, <coughs> put that up in the ceiling, connect your speaker cables to it, and then connect that to the speakers without anything connected to that your system works as normal. When you pair with it, with your phone, tablet, laptop, then this actually powers the speakers. It gives you about a 20 meter range. So for the people who are here today, Mike, what are they normally trying? So today, I think it's 150x. Yeah, 150x. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So 150x. So that's Mike's graciously uh, decided we would work with him to, you know, offer a promo today. So we'll do a little bit of sales spiel on these uh, presentations. It's just an opportunity to say thank you for supporting us. And what we find is, you know, if you get these in your home and you know hook them up use them it sort of gives you the gives you confidence in the sense of what it actually does how to install it how to use it and i guarantee you'll be yeah. using these and recommending them to customers oh, because it's just it's such a nifty little device it comes with a uh, little metal bracket with double-sided tape so if there's a speaker somewhere that's pretty much the same size as a magnet so you just put the double-sided tape on the speaker with the bracket, little bayonet thing, clicks in, that's it. <clears throat> Have you got any hooked up? Yeah, no. no. And, the, and here's for the really complicated um, setup diagram and the uh, instructions. That's pretty much what's in the instruction manual. So, uh, it's not modulated, but a little blue light comes on when you power it up, search for it on your phone. When you find Blue Wave Audio, hit the pair button. So, 
thing is with this while while it's working, if you get a phone call or you pause it, it mutes the audio. So when you finish your phone call, it just goes back to playing. Uh, that's it, gents. Thanks for your patience. Questions for the late camera?